You have an army, tens of thousands of men, and you come to the aid of a beleaguered ally. So close, you can hear the sounds of battle as your ally gamely holds out, but then the harsh realities of nature get in the way. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. Last week, things were still crazy at Gallipoli, with plans changing every day, even as the situation constantly deteriorated for the Allies. The Austro-Hungarian, German, and Bulgarian armies were driving their way through Serbia, and battles at the Isonzo River, in Artois, and in Champagne all came to an end, with total casualties on all sides approaching half a million men. And on the Eastern Front, sporadic Russian attacks took POWs by the tens of thousands. Here's what followed. That battle at the Isonzo River was the third battle for that river. As it turned out, there was only a week between the end of the third battle of the Isonzo River and the beginning of the fourth one, which kicked off November 10th. So a lot of people think of the fourth as a continuation of the third. But you know what? It's kind of more accurate to call the fourth a replay of the third. The objectives, the commanders, the strategy, and tactics were all basically the same. The main difference was the weather. Winter had arrived early this year in the Julian Alps, and, at least up there, snow and sleet made combat there almost impossible. Casualties in the third battle had been high on both sides, some 68,000 for the Italians and 42,000 for the Austro-Hungarians, and both sides worked really hard to bring their armies back up to snuff. The thing is, by this time, experienced Italian soldiers were being replaced with raw recruits straight out of training camp. That does not bode well for reducing casualties, especially when Italian Chief of Staff Luigi Cadorna's belief in the final push with mass infantry attacks against entrenched Austrian positions comes into the picture. On the Austrian side, since things were looking a lot better over on the Eastern Front than they were several months ago, General Svetasar Barojevich von Banya was able to not only replace his losses from the third battle, but also increase his reserves. His biggest problem was that Austrian industrial production could not keep up with demand. So he was always short of artillery shells, grenades, mortars, and even ammunition. One thing he did have was high morale. Against Russia, many of the polyglot soldiers of the Imperial Army had no sympathy for the war, but against the Italians, not so. They believed they were fighting to defend their homeland against traitors. So on this front, they were really gung-ho. Remember, Italy had been an ally of Austria-Hungary until the war broke out, but earlier this year had joined the Allies. Oh, a side note here. In the third battle, the Italian army had begun using steel helmets brought in from France. I've said before that on this front, since it was all rock, splinters from the limestone often caused deadly head wounds. So it's sort of remarkable that the Austrians would have to wait until autumn 1916 to get their own steel helmets. And heading further southeast to Serbia, we can see what the Austrians were up to there, where things were looking quite good for them. The Serbs were being inexorably pushed back by the Austrians, the Germans, and the Bulgarians. The fall of Nish on November 5th had been the worst blow to the Serbs since Belgrade fell a month ago. The German and Austrian papers made a big deal about it because it allowed a direct rail link from Berlin to Constantinople, and all of Europe now realized that the final days of Serbian resistance were now at hand. Down in Macedonia, though, the Bulgarians under General Todorov were having a tricky time with the invasion. The Serbs under Colonel Bojevic were defending themselves in the Katshanic Pass, daily beating back the Bulgarian assaults and keeping open the line of retreat for the main Serbian army. The Bulgarians were basically in the same position and trying to do the same thing as they had in the Second Balkan War in 1913. Only then, they were trying to drive a wedge between the Serbs and the Greeks, and now it was the French in place of the Greeks. Further south, the Bulgarians advanced towards the Babuna Pass, also well defended by the Serbs. If they forced this pass, both the Serbian line and the French line to the south were in danger of being flanked. It must be held at all costs. And here's a quote from the story of the Great War about what followed. The stand the Serbians made in Babuna Pass was one of those feats which will remain inscribed in the pages of history throughout the ages and will excite the admiration of all people, regardless of how their sympathies may lie towards the main issues of the war. In early November, Serbian Colonel Vasic had around 5,000 men. The Bulgarians had four times that number and a big advantage in artillery. Bulgarian attacks intensified as the week began, but they were still thrown back again and again. By this time, the French were only 15 kilometers away and could hear the sounds of battle. 
the road the French under General Maurice Sorel would have to take to the pass crossed the Cherna River, the Black River, and then crossed difficult mountain ridges, which the Bulgarians had fortified. Sorel was still determined to try. Thing is, the river was not fordable and was only crossable in one place, a small plank bridge at Vosartsi. At the beginning of the week, the French began to cross the bridge and scale the heights. The sound of battle now in range. On November 6th, the French attacked the Bulgarians at Mount Archangel, and Sorel knew he must break through here if he was to reach the Serbian forces. The French were outnumbered and the Bulgarian positions fortified, but still, at the first attack, the Bulgarians were driven from the base of the mountain. By the 10th, the French had pushed the Bulgarians out of Sirkovo, but Bulgarian reinforcements had begun to arrive. And by the end of the week, the Bulgarians, now 60,000 strong, began to take the offensive. The French could advance no more. Someone else who could seemingly advance no more was the Germans in the Northeast. We saw that Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg's forces had been stopped and were unable to take Dvinsk or Riga. And on November 12th, in a meeting with the Kaiser, Hindenburg said that if the Kaiser insisted on their capture, Hindenburg would resign. His forces were spending these days slowly retreating from Riga, Schlock, and Kemen. And here's something that happened last week that I didn't have time to talk about. The Battle of Banjo happened in Cameroon, November 4th through 6th. Now, earlier this year, the British commander in the region, Hugh Cunliffe, had won the Second Battle of Garua and the Battle of Nguandere. And when the rainy season had come, he had taken part in the ongoing siege of Mora instead of advancing to the German base at Jonda. Now that the rains had come and gone, he had moved towards the town of Banjo, which was a German fort under Captain Adolf Schipper that was the last German stronghold before Jande. The British occupied the town of Banjo in late October, but didn't attack the fort until November 4th. They attacked in a fog and surprised the Germans and Askaris, but were still forced to retreat. Throughout the next day, they were held at bay, with the Germans often using dynamite to hold them off, until the night of the 5th, in a thunderstorm, when the final attack was made. Schipper was killed, and much of the German garrison deserted, though most of the deserters were later captured. This pretty much marked the end of German resistance in northern Cameroon, though the siege of Mora would continue for months, and Jonda wouldn't fall into British hands until January 1916. And that was the week, the Italians trying yet again just a few days after the last push. The Germans despairing of taking Riga or Dvinsk, losing important territory in Africa, but on the move through northern Serbia, as further south, the French were unable to break through and stop the Bulgarians. One little wooden bridge. That's all the French had to get their men across the Cherna River. So close, they could hear their allies fighting the Bulgarians. Imagine how frustrating it must have been to hear that and know that the river was unfordable, uncrossable, except ever so slowly on a rickety wooden bridge. If only the river was shallower. If only the cliffs weren't so steep. If only. How many lives might have been saved? You could have reached your ally and made a stand together. You could have bought time to save tens of thousands of your civilians from the invaders. If only. Yes, if only this war had never begun. You wouldn't need to say, if only. Bulgaria was still fairly new to the war, and if you want to find out why they joined on the side of the Central Powers, you can check out our special episode about that right here. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Wallace Vaughn. Thank you, Wallace. If you want to support our show financially and get cool perks in return, consider supporting us on Patreon. And for more awesome historical photos and a glimpse behind the scenes, follow us on Instagram. See you next time.